The first speaker now is uh, Dr. Uh, James Tan from uh, UMTAT, um, who will give a presentation. Um, Dr. James Tan is Director of Investment and Enterprise at UMTAT. He's a Global Agenda Council member of the World Economic Forum. Um, Mr. Tan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I wish to express um, uh, our gratitude to the organizers uh, to invite UMTAT me and my colleague, uh, Jörg Weber, is sitting there uh, to attend this important event um, to share our views um, on this important issue. In fact, organizers ask me to talk about the broader context, meaning we just, not to just look at the hill of the Akili, but also looking at Akili himself. Um, in that sense, um, I would say if this international investment regime is a Pandora's box, and then there are quite a few hills that we need to look into that uh, the problems always see. The question is that how Achille fits into the modern times, serve the modern purposes, there may be not only the problem of the hill, there may be also the problem of the heart, the kidney, even the side or whatever. So um, let me just get to the broader context. Um, I think the important thing that we start with the, the big picture is that today, in the absence of a multilateral investment regime, unlike the trading system of WTO or um, uh, monetary system of IMF, and in the area of investment, there's no such a multilateral system. But, but there is a multilateral, uh, there is an international investment regime which consists of 3,240 plus investment treaties signed at bilateral, regional, sub-regional, inter-regional levels. So that is the, the, the kind of a strange body we have. Um, and the system has developed over the last six decades. So that's why uh, part of it is really aging and old. Um, we know that almost all countries are party to at least one investment treaties. And, um, and some countries have over 100 such investment treaties signed. Um, with regard to the EU, um, we see that there's 1,356 bilateral investment treaties signed between the member states, and there are also another 63 um, investment uh, treaties that with investment chapters or provisions, such as free trade agreement, cooperation agreement, so on and so forth. Now, I have... Um, three key messages. I already mentioned the overall message, meaning that there is a Pandora's box. Therefore, it's time to fix the Pandora's box, um, like it or not. Um, first, that the international regime shows a diversing trends that I will show you the three directions that the regime is going. And second, that the investment regime has to overcome three major challenges, and I will highlight them. And then, um, there's a need for reform. So what is the way forward? Um, first, um, the, the investment regime shows a divergent trends. There are three. One is what we call upscaling. Upscaling in terms of substance and upscaling in terms of participation. In a sense, we have seen that even in the recent years, if we see the, the, the diagram, see the line, not the bars, um, in a sense, we see that there's cumulatively there's continued increase of the number of investment treaties. And last year, in terms of bilateral investment treaties, 44 treaties signed. If you take out the year of the holidays and, and the weekends, and basically in terms of working days, on average, one treaty signed per week. You don't see any treaty making process at pace, pace in, uh, in, in other areas. Of course, if you get, go back to to the 1990s and early uh, 2000, and then you see on average three to four treaties signed per week. That is the pace of treaty making. Although you see that the bars, uh, in the sense that the number of treaties signed um, have declined per year, but in fact, if you look at the number of countries participating in the treaty making, you see that there are 88 countries are now engaged in negotiating about eight uh, regional treaties. What has been shown is that countries are more engaged actively in regional treaty making. 
instead of bilateral investment treaties. So the pace of investment, treaty, uh, investment rulemaking at international level continued to grow and accelerate it. So that's in terms of participation. In terms of substance, we see that all these treaties are being negotiated, particularly the mega treaties, that there is a kind of upscaling in terms of provisions, standards, the scope, expansion. So this is the trend of upscaling. In the meantime, we also see another trend, the trend of disengaging. A number of developing countries have started um, uh, terminating unilaterally their bilateral investment treaties with some important um, uh, developed countries. We have also seen a number of countries denounce um, the, 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 the treaty conventions, um, the, the dispute settlement uh, uh, conventions um, in this area. We have also seen fairly recently some countries start um, negotiating the termination of treaties by mutual consent. So this is a kind of a trend of disengaging. The third trend we have seen is that many countries, according to our statistics, 44 countries and, the, and the four um, regional groupings are now readjusting their investment treaty negotiation positions, revising their treaty models. So that's the third way. So this is the diverging trends we have seen, we have observed in the, um, in, in the current um, uh, trends of international investment rulemaking. Now why countries are doing that? Why regional groupings are doing that? So we see that there are three major challenges that the investment regime is faced with. This overall, uh, um, the, the underlying driving force is the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift from the, from the era of liberalization of, of globalization to the era of regulation. And here in the area of investment is a shift from freedom of investment to investment for sustainable development. That is the paradigm shift we have observed and we have seen many countries now at the national level revise their laws and regulations um, linking closely the national investment policies with the sustainable development goals with uh, industrial policies. So industrial policies are back, are back in fashion again. Um, at the international level, as I mentioned, we see many countries are now changing their investment positions, uh, investment treaty negotiation positions and, um, and adjusting their rules. So we, we heard um, the Hubert said this morning that even for the new treaties that TTIP is um, uh, putting in the sustainable development dimensions uh, here and there in the new treaties. So basically there are three challenges, mega challenges we see. First is that how to integrate sustainable development objectives into the investment treaties. This applies not only to the 3,240 existing treaties. How do we deal with them? They, they were formulated in the, in, the, in the past decades. And uh, if you look at them, we have looked at them at UNCTAD. We see that most of them do not have a strong sustainable development dimension in it. And, um, and, 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 then, and then the question is, how do we do that? And the second is that how to factor in into the new treaties that are being negotiated and formulated. Now, the second challenge is related to how to rebalance the rights and obligations between the firms and the states, and how to create sufficient policy space for governments to regulate. So it's related to the right to regulate. And we observed in the past that there was too much attention paid to the rights of the, of the investors and obligations of the states. So that's why we see the concerns as you have today, and the, the previous speakers mentioned that. And the third major, major challenge is, is how to address the systemic complexity of, of the international investment regime. So negotiators and countries are focusing on individual treaties, but when you put them together, signed at different times, with different partners at different levels of development, and when you put them together, you see the problems of coherence and the problem of consistency 
and there are many systematic, systemic problems that need to be addressed. Um, and we also see the coherence between the investment treaties on the one side and other public policies at the national and international levels, such as trade, competition, the environmental, social, so on and so forth. There are so many. So this kind of level of, of consistency is, 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 is a serious problem as well. So for these three challenges, the question is, the, what is the way forward? Of course, there are two big options. One is change it, reform it. The other is abandoning it. I think that this afternoon, um, then we have the colleagues will discuss on, 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 the, on the second option. But I wish to, to say that at UNCTAD and our observation to the majority of the stakeholders in this area is that we need to, to reform it. Um, through our dialogue at the various platforms, including the World Investment Forum, we see the convergence of, of reforming the system, changing the system. We see still the divergence in terms of the extent, the scope of the changes. So that's what we see, and we continue to build, um, build um, uh, the consensus on that at a multilateral level. Now, I see there are three major issues we need to address in this change or reform. Now, first is to establish a set of um, global guiding principles for international investment policy making. It is very important that since actions are taken at a bilateral, sub-regional, regional levels, there, there is a need at the multilateral level for consensus on guiding principles in making international investment policies or international investment treaties. The second thing is that we need urgently to address collectively the coherence issues, the policy coherence, as I mentioned, between the national and international investment policies, between the investment policies, and other public policies. And the third issue is to deal with uh, the, the, the investment treaty reforms in a systemic and a gradual manner. We see the changes cannot happen overnight because of the back, the, the kind of uh, bag uh, that we are carrying, which is the 3,000, because its actions are taken at a bilateral regional level, so it needs time. But it also needs proper sequencing and a strategy. That should be agreed upon at, at collectively uh, in the investment community or investment negotiators committee and policy making community. Um, now let me come to the, uh, the, the specific issue, which is ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism. Again, a broader picture beyond the EU, uh, but including EU. In, in this area, the, um, I just wish to, um, to present you the current trends the, to summarize the key problems and highlight some of the reform options that we have um, uh, observed the discussion over the past years. Now, first, we see that, in fact, um, uh, the vast majority of bilateral investment treaties and other investment treaties, that's 3,200 plus, um, the majority of them have ISDS in it. Um, and, and the total number of the, um, and in terms of the cases, we see, according to our statistics, it's about 568 cases, known cases, uh, 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 for the investor state dispute. But having, uh, we need to bear in mind that not all the cases are known. Uh, we estimate there's another about 20, 15 to 20% of the cases. So it's something like seven, 700 cases uh, so far uh, in that. There are a number of problems. I, um, um, but here I just wish to summarize in terms of the respondent states. Um, uh, um, uh, over the past years, at least 98 governments have been respondents to at least one or more investment treaty cases. Over 70% of the known cases were brought against the developing and transition economies. And in terms of host states, and basically the majority of the cases, um, let's see, um, 89%. Um, and the claims were brought by the investors from developed countries, particularly EU states and, uh, and the US. In terms of legal instruments, it mainly happened with NAFTA and Energy Charter. Uh, in terms of arbitral 
uh, forums, of course, we know the exit and, um, and Oncitral are the main ones in dealing with cases. In terms of outcomes, that's half of the cases have been uh, settled and approximately that 43% were decided in favor of the states and 31% in favor of the investors. So the majority of the cases, in majority of the cases, governments won. Um, and of course, there's another 26% of the cases were basically settled. Uh, and we don't know how it was settled because it's confidential. Now, coming to the EU um, and the US, um, in the case of ISDS, we see that, uh, that out of the 568 cases, basically 20% of the cases were brought against the EU members and 16 cases were brought against the US um, government. And in terms of the Caymans and their home states, and basically the US and the EU members accounted for 75%, of the investment treaty arbitrations, so investors claiming that. Um, if we put the ISDS issue in a broader context, broader perspective, let's see what we have today in terms of for, uh, FDI stock. The global FDI stock reaches 26 trillion US dollars. And this, the 26 trillion US dollars is carried out by over 104,000 multinational companies with, um, with 892,000 foreign affiliates worldwide, worldwide. So basically, the, the 700 cases, if we see, including the known cases. So this we put into perspective. It is, it is not a big deal um, in terms of this pers perspective. And we, we also see that uh, there's an issue of effectiveness of all these mechanisms. The cases take longer, to, very long time to settle, things like that. Having said that, having said that, I must uh, emphasize that a number of the ISDS cases have far-reaching implications for international investment policy making and have impact on sustainable development. That's why we need to do a careful assessment on this issue. And, and to see what's the way forward. Now, in terms of key problems and concerns, and it's well known to you, so I don't have to, 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 to elaborate, but I just wish to, to highlight seeing that, um, that uh, the issue of legitimacy of ad hoc tribunals and their awards, transparency, um, uh, treaty shopping, inconsistency of arbitral decisions, absence of appeals mechanisms, um, uh, arbitrators' independence and impartiality and high cost of arbitration, these are among the major concerns and problems that we have regarding ISDS. Now for us and for me as far as I, I'm concerned as I mentioned earlier, that ISDS is only one problem of the international investment regime and it's not the only problem and it's not even the root of the problem. So we need to address the system in its entirety. And in that sense, we need to keep that in mind while we're addressing the ISDS system. And for that, for ISDS system, that we, we engaged in a dialogue over the past three years at different levels with all the investment development community. And then and, and we summarized the ideas of reform into five options, five sets of options that is uh, that is, we, we have that we, sorry that I forgot to ask you to collect. Furthermore, we have, do we? No, no, sorry, that, that's the one. <laughs> um, the five sets of, uh, of options for reform, and, um, and I see that the question is not to, um, at this stage, not to discuss. I mean, we have enough discussion and debate on good and bad of the ISDS. We should move beyond that. The question, the questions should be that uh, what, what would be the way forward if we drop ISDS? And what would be the, 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 the way forward if we want to re keep it? And how should we reform it? So the question should be along that lines. Um, I would like to address the issue of how to reform and leaving the questions on way forward in the absence of ISDS. I think that's the next panel. 
and we have eminent experts and ambassador of South Africa, Karine, and we have also have Sonia from Third World Network. Our, our friends have been discussing that all the time. They have the insights. Now let me summarize the options for the, for the reform. The first thing is that if we want to keep it um, and use it in the, in, the, in the investment regime, then we need to, to promote alternative dispute resolutions, which is very important. The non-binding non uh, alternative dispute resolution methods, such as uh, conciliation and the mediation, can help to save time and money and find a mutually uh, acceptable solutions, prevent escalation of the dispute, and preserves the workable relationship between the disputing parties. So there are many, um, many uh, advantages of that. So this kind of alternative dispute resolution could go hand in hand with the strengthening of dispute uh, prevention and management policies at the national level. The second set of options re uh, relates to modifying the existing ISDS mechanisms through individual IAs. So it's not only the problem of the mechanism of ISDS. Sometimes the problem is embedded in the treaty itself, substantive provisions and other issues. So we need to address that to avoid the problem. And for that, I don't have to go into details. Um, I just wish to bring you to the attention of UNCTAD's uh, investment policy framework for sustainable development that we laid out the different options of addressing the substantive issues related to investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. The third set of uh, that reform relates to limiting investors' um, access to ISDS, meaning to avoid a frivolous claim um, by uh, restricting, I'm finishing, yeah, uh, by restricting the range of the investors uh, who qualify for the benefits and, um, and reducing the, um, the subject matter scope for the, for the claim or by introducing the, the, the requirement of exhaustion of domestic remedy as one of the options, but there are quite a few of them. Now the fourth set of the reform relates to introducing appeals facility. I think it was mentioned earlier also by the speakers. And the fifth is related, perhaps we should consider creating a standing international investment court to deal with the issue to avoid a number of problems like um, impartiality, uh, that, um, that partiality and independence. There are a number of issues I mentioned earlier. So, so there, there are ways and means to improve the system to serve better the purpose of uh, investors, governments, stakeholders, and um, most of all, sustainable development goals of all countries. So in conclusion, I just wish to see that Akili uh, himself is, um, is getting old, and, uh, and uh, the question is whether it can serve the modern purposes, and we need to fix it. Um, so it's not the, the hill is a problem there. Are, many problems and we need to deal with the systematic way. And we believe that a fundamental holistic approach to reform of the regime is very important. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is, is Celeste Drake. Uh, Celeste Drake is um, from AFL-CIO, um, the American Federation of Labor Congress of Industrial Organizations. She's a trade and globalization policy specialist, and she will bring in the uh, US point of view, but also uh, the point of view of working not only on the TTIP or following TTIP, but also the TTP um, uh, negotiations. I'm also happy to announce that uh, Sean Don has arrived, so he will take over um, uh, uh, for the, the next panel. And just a practical announcement, we are aware of the heating problem, so we're, <laughs> we're checking that we can uh, cool over the room a little bit. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to start my premise with, um, as it says the title of my talk, ISDS is fundamentally flawed, and given that it's fundamentally flawed, um, I think the chances for keeping it, at, if you want to call it a regime, a system, a scheme, um, and making it work are really slim to none, very, very tiny. And I think, um, although I appreciate the candidness with Mr. Schlegelmilk, and I'm sorry if I messed up your name, uh, spoke, I think this isn't a problem really of sloppy drafting. It's not that the lawyers who were drafting these documents didn't know what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing, and that's the problem with ISDS. 
um, a lawyer for uh, the Methanex case, which is a famous case where the Methanex company sued the U.S. under NAFTA because California had banned a gasoline additive that was poisoning the water. Um, he said, NAFTA does clearly create some rights for foreign investors that local citizens and companies don't have. But that's the whole purpose of it. Um, more recently, in an op-ed in Forbes magazine, Forbes wrote that that's actually the point and purpose of the agreement, meaning the TTIP, to protect investments from whatever nonsense might cross the synapses of the body politic. So in other words, what workers want, what consumers want, what communities want, what small businesses want, that's nonsense. And certainly it is, if you're a multinational enterprise and the thing that you want is to free yourself from regulation. But to actual citizens, it's not nonsense. And that's the problem. I, I appreciate, again, the candidness, Mr. Schlegelmilk said, that he admitted that ISDS does give greater rights to foreign investors than to domestic investors. But he posited that that's not the correct comparison, that what you're doing is guaranteeing that your foreign investors also have greater rights elsewhere. And that's the equivalency. And what I ask is, one, how does that square, in fact, with the promise that TTIP is actually going to be good for SMEs, SMEs which are primarily domestic and not going to be able to access the ISDS system. But how does that square with citizens? Are citizens fine with their governments giving foreign investors greater rights than their own domestic businesses have? If you put that up to a referendum, which I'm not suggesting, but if you did, assuming that parliaments and congresses are in fact responsive to their citizens, would they vote for that? I don't think so. I mean, there is a, a concept in democracy that it's equal justice for all, blind justice with the blindfold, meaning everybody gets the same, no matter if they're foreign, domestic, what religion, what class, what color, all of these things. Systems of justice should be public, democratic, and available to all in society on an equal basis. ISCS just simply doesn't meet that test. Um, and I think for Americans in particular, you know, we had a famous case in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, saying for schools, separate but equal was unconstitutional. So why for investors is separate but equal constitutional? Why is it okay to not have equal protection of the laws, which is enshrined in the U.S. Constitution? But let's assume we can get over the philosophical and the political objection to the creation of the separate system of justice. Um, and that that's all fine with us. What are some of the other flaws that it has? Well, number one is that the panels are not required to consider at all either national laws or the public good in reaching their decisions. Um, both the US and the EU claim that the ISDS doesn't undermine national or EU rights or principles, and USTR goes to great pains to show us that some of the language in its model bit copies US case law, and indeed, it does copy some language from US case law. The problem is that there's a lot of extra rights in the model bit, the right to fair and equitable treatment, which doesn't exist under US law and can be uh, are, um, interpreted expansively, but there's a lot that's missing. So there's no concept of sovereign immunity. There's nothing that a government can do under ISDS where it says, this is restricted from challenge. So when we're talking about some of the things that the EU is trying to put into place to protect this right, supposed right to regulate, if that's not an absolute carve out, it's not really protected and it's not really safe. There's something else under American law called the rational basis test. So any law that um, a government enacts, unless it goes after a protected class. So for instance, it's a law that actually discriminates against uh, people on the basis of color. All it has to do is pass the rational basis test. Is there a rational basis for the law? Is there a rational basis why Peru might want Renko to clean up the area around the lead smelter? Is there a rational basis why California might want to ban MTBE from, as a gasoline additive? Is there a rational basis why the um, state of San Luis Potosi might not want to give a building permit to a toxic waste facility? Absolutely. Those would be okay under U.S. law. But it seems like the ISDS system turns that on its head and it applies strict scrutiny 
which is the most critical test under US law, and it applies that to everything that a government does. So while the public interest may be vindicated at random under ISDS, in fact, the US won the Methanex case, it's not vindicated in cases such as Metalclad versus Mexico or Eurico versus Poland. So vindicating the public interest simply isn't the point of the system. And interested parties, they can file amicus briefs under ISDS, but they can't intervene and participate in a case as they can under US law. And this is particularly unjust when you're talking about communities trying to protect themselves from harm. Another fundamental flaw is the ad hoc nature of the unaccountable panels. ISDS asks us as citizens to trust that a decision made by an arbitrator who isn't democratically elected, isn't accountable to citizens, and isn't required to respect whatever our national law is, um, is going to do the right thing. And we have some studies in uh, November 2012 study by Cecilia Olivet and Pia Eberhardt that went into depth on who these arbitrators are. They're very clubby. A small set, subset of them sit on the vast majority of cases. They don't just handle cases. They also lobby governments to avoid reform or abolition of the ISDS scheme. Um, and they, they work together, not only sitting on panels, but again, then they go represent someone. And as Gus Van Harten, who you'll hear from later, also did a study showing they tend to rule expansively. So if there's a way to expand the rights of the investor through ISDS, this is more likely than not what's going to happen. Uh, another fundamental flaw, flaw is that ISDS essentially privatizes all of the gains of international investment, but socializes the losses. So anytime an investor sues because it's lost its expected profits, it's the citizens of the host country that end up paying through their taxpayer dollars. But yet, that money, it's not like it comes home and uh, the company that wins says, hey, guess what, American workers? You get to share because we just got this windfall profit. They don't get that. Nor do the citizens of the country get to share in the profits made in the host country. Another fundamental flaw is the system's inability to combat or control frivolous lawsuits. We hear again all the time from USTR, we fixed that problem, it's over. Well, if you look at what the US did, it has only gone after frivolous suits, which is in fact a very, very high bar to reach because you're basically saying that the claimant has not put anything in its claim that could state a possible cause of action. So you're screening out very, very few cases and you're not screening out cases for lack of standing or other issues that ought to be dealt with quite quickly and be thrown out immediately. And a good example of that was the Pacific Rim versus El Salvador case when Pacific Rim didn't actually meet the qualifications to have standing as a US corporation. And it took a couple of years for the panel to figure that out, racking up fees in the meantime, by the way. When the answer was actually pretty simple, Pacific Rim just got to transfer the case uh, and sue in an ISDS panel under El Salvador's own domestic investment law. But meantime, money, money and time were wasted. Um, and when we're looking at expansive interpretations and what is the next thing that uh, an investor is going to claim as a right, well, let's look at, again, what some of these investors have said they want from US trade agreements when they make public filings to the USTR. Walmart, in fact, has said that it wants the USTR to seek restrictions on rules affecting size, hours of operation, and geographic location of stores. It's, in fact, a direct attack through a trade agreement on the fact that many communities in the US and elsewhere simply are not interested in having Walmart come in and drive small local businesses out of business. So all of a sudden, if this does become a right under TTIP, Walmart can sue to vindicate that right using ISDS. So I've uh, reached the end of my time. There's just one more case I wanted to talk about. Uh, the fact that the system does lack professional jurists. I agree that one way that particular problem could be solved would be a permanent court. But the lack of professional jurists, the lack of the applicability of stare decisis, meaning common law, meaning the panels have to follow the law of prior panels, means that panels can pretty much do anything. They're runaway panels. And the best example of this, I think, is the 
Cargill case, where Cargill sued Mexico because Mexico was trying to prefer sugar over high fructose corn syrup. Now, uh, reasonable folks can argue about whether that was a health issue or whether that was a trade protectionist issue, but the fact is Cargill received damages, not just for its losses in Mexico, but for losses in the United States that it attributed fewer exports to Mexico because of these rules. That is not covered anywhere under the guiding uh, chapter 11 of NAFTA on which this case was based. And in fact, because it was under the additional facility rules, Mexico got to appeal to a Canadian court, and the Canadian court said, well, we can't really look at the merits, so it's all fine. So even when panels get it absolutely, absolutely, absolutely wrong, nothing happens. And I'm not sure what kind of additional wording, or how you might say fair and equitable treatment means this and not this is really gonna fix that problem. Thanks. Celeste, thank you very much. And it's wonderful to see you in Brussels. Uh, my apologies uh, again for, uh, for, for, for the late entrance. Uh, I am uh, uh, preparing to mount an ISDS case uh, against uh, the Belgium labor unions, I'm sorry, uh, for, uh, for yesterday's strike, which kept me from getting here. But uh, 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 well, at least I'm going to take consultations on that. Uh, we have, uh, we are now running, I think, about 15 minutes late. Y Jan here has, has, has told me he can race through this presentation. We can get us all to a coffee thing, mainly because he's got to go the opposite way. He's got to get back to London uh, this afternoon. So, uh, Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I will try to keep it short. Um, I actually dumped my entire presentation, and I think I'm just going to respond to what has been said so far, because you have not had the option to actually ask questions so far, and the worst is you're not going to be able to ask me any questions after, afterwards, because I have to race out again. Um, so I have been working on uh, investment treaty law and its intersection with EU law since a couple of years, it being involved in the, in the European context, especially in the European Parliament. And um, I, I think there's a there's, I, I'm going to actually pick up on the different issues that have been raised to kind of show how, how all of that actually fits together very well. And I just want to start with Celeste Drake's uh, remarks that um, the whole purpose of ISDS is actually to con uh, convey greater rights on foreign investors, <coughs> and that is openly admitted. It could not not be openly admitted because that is indeed the whole purpose of the system. And if one looks at it from a European law perspective, that is nothing new. As Mr. Schlegelmich already pointed out, we have, for the purpose of establishing an internal market, rights which are conferred to foreign, meaning other European economic actors, which are not necessarily conferred to nationals. That is called that discrimination à rebours in French, the inverse uh, discrimination. It's something which we know since a long time when we want to establish a greater market. And that is exactly the purpose of investment treaties. They are like, if you want so, <coughs> a very primitive version of an integration treaty. They open up markets, they secure rights to investors, and we do confer greater rights to foreigners in order to attract that investment. That's the theory. Um, and, but it's also the reality, let's put it that way, in terms of greater rights. Um, I was tempted to say something about your stare decisis point. Um, I think we are rather lucky that we do not have stare decisis, because otherwise we would be bound to a whole lot of uh, case law, which might not exactly be what everyone wishes for. Um, what I find the most important point, and I will come back to that at the end of my presentation, was Dr. Chan's pro, uh, pose, uh, point on establishing coherence between national policies, national investment policies, and international investment policies. And that is where I want to take you on a little trip, uh, which is to think about what the European Union is about. European Union comes out of the European Economic Community, and the whole purpose was to abolish borders, uh, uh, barriers to trade, uh, establish free movement of citizens, uh, well, that came later, but uh, goods, services, free movement of capital, and freedom of establishment. In basic, what we basically did <coughs> over the last 50 years is to establish an internal market in which economic actors do not face obstacles when crossing borders. Well, that is precisely what BITs partially also address. So we do have to be concerned about their interaction. It has been mentioned so many times by, Dr. Schlegel, by Mr. Schlegelmich that indeed we have to get it right and that it is 
an important step forward what we're doing now in order to overcome the deficiencies of the old treaties that are in place and there are thousands of them. And that is perfectly right. I think one important point to mention in all of that is why do we have these treaties that exist? The existing treaties are all treaties that are between developing countries and developed countries when we look into the past. This has changed slightly because, of course, we have the Eastern and Central European countries have uh, uh, <coughs> concluded treaties with the US and Canada. We do have member states today with, which have treaties with US and Canada, and they need to be reformed. That is perfectly right. What I slightly take issue with is the question how. There is one fundamental point, which is the original versions of these treaties in terms of substantive rights, it was mentioned many times before, provide for protection standards which are very wide, which are not very defined, and which are therefore problematic. That was not problematic in the past because primarily they served for protecting our interests in poorer countries, countries which had issues with rule of law, countries in which we wanted our investors to go safely and be able to have more or less the same standards of protection as they have under our home constitutional systems. Now, <coughs> if we now want to reform the system, we have two ways of thinking about that. One way is the way the Commission has been doing it, which is to see, identify the issues and try to put patches on an old model. Um, my argument is that that might not work simply because the old model was never made, was never designed for applying for, to us, if you want so. If we try to identify issues and find patches, well, <laughs> I'm a practicing lawyer partially myself, it's a matter of discussion how much these patches can actually achieve. I just want to give you a few examples. The Fair and Equitable Treatment Standard, as now redefined in the NAFTA Treaty, uh, sorry, in the, in the CETA Agreement, we do find there now a couple of lines of definitions. What are legitimate expectations? Honestly, if one starts to look at that from a lawyer's perspective, there's just more words that can be turned around unless we really have something that... <laughs> I don't deserve that there. Um, <laughs> we are adding certain... Again, we, what we're doing is we're putting patches on an old model which might not really have been designed for us, hoping that then it will hold and it will actually protect our interests as well. If we do not, and what we're doing is we're using this old model which comes from international law, which was designed to provide special, uh, special protection for uh, foreign investors, and we try to fix it through these safeguards, through these clarifications, through these definitions. We need to get that right. I think what has been done so far in CETA is not sufficient. As I mentioned, I think I, I, those provisions can quite easily be rediscussed if you want so. But there is also a more fundamental point, which is that actually we're giving in the CETA agreement a higher level of protection to investors and therefore less um, uh, protection to uh, the rights to regulate as compared even with the US agreements, the model agreements with the NAFTA, uh, sorry, with the uh, Canadian uh, FIPA, the investment uh, agreement that the Canadians use as their model, which binds, for example, fair and treatment down to the meaning under customary law of the international minimum standards, which is much lower than what we see now in CETA. The other point is expropriation. No expropriation without compensation is a principle of constitutional law, said Mr. Schlegelmich this morning. This is perfectly right. All our constitutions have that principle. But if we look a little bit closer, we will see that, for example, the German constitution, which dates from 1949, <coughs> and has uh, and is, if you want so, the strongest reaction to uh, what can go wrong uh, when human rights are not uh, protected, it differentiates very clearly between an outright expropriation in terms of seizure, a purposeful seizure, and on the other hand, the definition of the scope and limits of property. One thing is reviewable by courts. If there is an expropriation without compensation, courts can review that. If, however, the definition of the scope and limit of a property right is concerned, that is something which is a political decision, and that is not subject to court scrutiny, because otherwise we would be mingling 
what should not be mingled. That is what we call the separation of powers. And let me just pick up on Mr. Schlegelmich's example with Germans' exit from um, nuclear power. Of course, we are happy that any tribunal sitting under the ECT treaty can only award damages and cannot order, let's say, the um, exit from nuclear energy to be reversed. The point is the following. If something was wrong with a decision to exit nuclear power, in legal terms, that would be governed by the German constitution. If something were wrong with that, well, under German constitution law, that decision must fall and cannot be upheld. An investor in nuclear energy would get back its possibility to continue operating nuclear power facilities. An investment tribunal cannot do that. It can only award damages if something went wrong. The problem is just if under the German constitution it was right, and therefore not illegal, to exit nuclear energy, the question is how can that then give rise to a different venue, to a different discussion? What we actually should be wanting is to determine whether what was done was right or wrong, legal or illegal. And once it is determined to be legal, the way for the investor for the future is free to continue economic activity. Losses accrued until then must be compensated for. That's correct. But what we cannot have is a system in which we have, on the one hand, a constitutional court deciding that something is under the constitution legal, and on the other hand, having the opportunity to, comp to get compensation for losses in the long run. That is an intrinsic clash between the national system and <coughs> the international system as we establish it through investment treaties. By the way, in Europe, that's exactly the same. If we look at cases like, for example, the FIAM case of the European Court of Justice, that is exactly the same principle which was written down by the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Justice. How can we then bring all of that together? How can we establish then coherence between national policies, national rules on state liability, and international rules on state liability? That is a problem. One way is to give national courts a chance to actually fix what has gone wrong. Because I don't want to say that nothing goes wrong when governments take decisions. Lots goes wrong. And even in Germany, which always tries to stand out as a model country, we do have on a daily basis many cases against government actions and many times citizens win against the state as well. But when they win, they get the removal of the measure and the national courts under their constitutions have those powers. So we should let them do their work, which means we should first let national courts engage with a problem and therefore restrict access to ISDS until that has been taken care of. How long does that take? That is a matter of discussion. Some people would say, no, let's have full exhaustion of local remedies because that would really ensure that local remedies can actually safeguard the logic of um, illegal acts being removed, legal acts being confirmed. That is also the system that we've established for ourselves in the European Union under the European Convention of Human Rights. You only have access to the case to the court in Strasbourg once there is exhaustion of local remedies. I do have acknowledged that in some countries that is not really, that's at least not appetizing, maybe not even feasible, simply because in some countries in the European Union that takes too long. Well, if we want, and they get condemned, by the way, in Strasbourg for, too, uh, for periods of decision which are just too long and therefore violating themselves, the right to access of justice. So we could also, instead of having exhaustion of local remedies, have a rule on local litigation requirements with a time period, which we would consider still to be within what our European, European Convention of Human Rights requires. What that is, my best guess, five years maybe, doesn't sound appetizing to foreign investors. At the same time, our investors have to put up with that within the internal market. So limitation of local remedy, uh, limitation, sorry, local litigation requirements would be certainly something that should be added and be stated very clearly so as to address the public issues with ISDS at the moment. And the other one is something on the substance. And for that, I just want to read out <coughs> two short texts to you. The one is the notification by the uh, U.S. government to the House of Representatives informing it about the negotiations in, uh, on TTIP. 
On investment, they write, the US government writes, the aim is to seek to secure US investors in the EU important rights comparable to those that would be available under US legal principles and practice, while ensuring that EU investors in the US are not accorded greater substantive rights with respect to investment protection than US investors have in the US. That is the American vision of what should be in, in TTIP. Let's look at what Europe says to the same thing. And here we have to look into the recently enacted regulation of the Parliament and the Council on the financial responsibility resulting from ISDS. And what we see there is, in the recitals, a clarification. Union agreements should afford foreign investors the same high level of protection as union law and the general principles common to the laws of the member states that they grant to investors from within the union, but no higher level of protection. So what we're having is a slightly paradox situation. On the American side, we do not want EU investors to have more rights than US investors in the US. On the EU, we don't want to have <coughs> greater rights for US investors than EU investors in the EU. Is there a way out of that? Well, one way is to reaffirm that, that politically there is the will on both sides not to go beyond what our national constitutions provide for. We want rule of law. We want a system in which citizens and economic actors, including investors, all get the rights that they deserve. In both sides of the Atlantic, I think we have established mechanisms for that. And if we clarify that that is what we want, and we put this general principle of no greater rights for foreign investors in there, that will be a guiding principle for interpreting then the substantive rights as they are spelled out, FET, expropriation, and all the others. And we therefore make sure that even if we let arbitrators decide this, they will not go way beyond what would be legitimate expectations. So to close up, and I think that links back to the first panel, what we really need to do is, I guess, listen to the public concerns that have been voiced so far. <coughs> the fears of losing the right to regulate can maybe not be addressed by simply writing in there that there is a right to regulate. But we can say that the balance struck between public and private interests so far in our constitutional systems, in our European law systems in 50 years, is more or less what we are looking at guaranteeing. And we can't guarantee that for all of Europe, maybe um, in the same fashion as we have set up uh, it in the European Union so far. If we want to reinsure foreign investors that that will be the protection that they get, then we should also write that into the treaties. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Jan, and thank you for um, uh, managing to bring all of that EU and US regulation down to a single paragraph. That's, uh, that's very important work. Uh, the, um, uh, if we could just abridge the coffee break just a little bit, just so we kind of get back something close to time. So I, I'm sure everyone here wants coffee, uh, a, a glass of water, and so on. But can we do it in five minutes, quick turnaround, and then we can come back uh, and we can, you get a chance to fire questions at this eminent panel, plus who are going to be joined by a couple more. All right, so if we gather back here in five minutes in at, uh, when we say 11.30, seven minutes. All right. As, as someone wisely said to me, there's no such thing as a seven-minute coffee break in Brussels. Uh, but I thank you very much for, uh, uh, for, for, for keeping it fairly quick. Uh, we're going to try and, and, and move quickly. We have, uh, while you went out there, we created a Twitter wall uh, up here. Uh, and uh, that's me uh, in better days uh, in that picture up there. Uh, and that's really the goal of, the, of, of this session is to open things up to... Uh, 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 to the floor and, and to get uh, a discussion going. You've heard a lot of speeches, you've heard a lot of presentations this morning. Uh, it's time to have a, a, a lively discussion. And I think with ISDS, we tend to have pretty lively discussions, don't we? Uh, the, um, um, we're joined by, 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 by a couple of people on the, uh, on the panel here. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Maricha Shaka whose name I've mispronounced many a time uh, and have just done so again, who is a member of the European Parliament and is a, uh, someone who follows these issues uh, very quickly. Uh, Paul, next to her from uh, Friends of the Earth, uh, 
and uh, again, as someone who follows trade issues uh, very closely. And down at the end, Luisa Santos, who's a, uh, who is someone who you often see on these, uh, uh, on these TTIP panels uh, around Europe as the voice of Business Europe uh, on, on, on trade policy here. I thought what we'd start off with is just a real, and I've told them one or two minutes, no more. Uh, uh, quick response uh, from the new panelists uh, uh, here. Then what we'll do is uh, we'll open it up to the floor and we'll start taking questions, I think in groups of three, uh, just so the, 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 the panelists can respond uh, to that. And if everyone's happy with that, uh, and if all goes to plan, we should be vaguely on time for lunch. Uh, so, uh, why don't we start off uh, perhaps with uh, uh, Mariches, again, my, my apologies for, for, for the mispronunciation. Uh, why don't you just give us a, a kind of, in, in a minute or two, you've heard some of the presentations this morning. You've been following this issue uh, uh, for some time. Uh, just give us your response. Thank you so much, and thanks to all the organizers for bringing us together. I think there's a fierce competition for uh, meetings on TTIP this morning, so uh, it's good to see a packed room. Um, my work uh, around ISDS has been more uh, focused from the TTIP angle, so before I start I was just curious to see how many in the room think that TTIP is in principle a good idea. And how many of you think that it will never be able to be good enough or functioning at all? Okay. Not bad, uh, not bad, because I think uh, this discussion is becoming uh, so polarized to an extent that sometimes people are only seeking confirmation of their own points of view, uh, and that it's very hard to get sort of you know academic analytical um, uh, information. I think this morning, um, you know, part of the presentations were clearly uh, from a from a clear point of view against or or in favor of ISDS, and some are more sort of um, uh, objective. Let me start by saying that I've never been a fan of ISDS. Uh, everyone who looks at what's going on uh, with the current uh, ISDS mechanisms that we have sees that there are many problems. I don't think there's anyone who thinks it's working perfectly right now. Um, I'm still very undecided on what to do with ISDS in TTIP. Uh, the main reason for that is that um, the member states have given a mandate to the European Commission. They've done so with a reason, I suppose. Uh, and, and the questions that we have to ask ourselves is whether uh, TTIP can help make some of the problems better uh, that we have with ISDS or whether it could make things worse. And of course, we have to ask ourselves whether we need it at all. And the unprecedented public consultation that has been called by the European Commission is unique. Uh, and I'm eagerly awaiting the outcome because I think that is the uh, most comprehensive stakeholder uh, poll. Uh, questioning that we've ever seen. At the same time, of course, it's not a referendum about ISDS. I think that's something to keep in mind as well. But I'm very interested in the consultation. We've been pushing the Commission to come forward with it because, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Another argument that we often hear, and as a uh, member of European Parliament, I think is, is one that we really have to consider is, is the suggestion that uh, the European Commission or the European Parliament would easily give up the right to regulate. Now, on the one hand, within the right to regulate or the space to re regulate, apparently a flawed system of ISDS has emerged. So let us at least make sure that we don't repeat something like that. Uh, at the same time, I don't know any member of European Parliament, well, a few actually. I don't know many members of European Parliament who um, would, would want to give up their right to regulate at all. In fact, we get accused of the opposite on a daily basis, as if the European Parliament is interested in increasing its own role and position um, all the time. So I agree with the gentleman from UNCTAD who said um, that there are basically two options. Do we need ISDS uh, in TTIP or generally at all? Uh, or, or can it be reformed? Um, of course, after answering the question, can it be reformed, there's still a spectrum of options. I think what's been missing from the discussion on ISDS more than anything else is what kind of ISDS we see in different scenarios. Uh, it is often uh, presented um, as if there is one model for ISDS, and that is not the case. There are many differentiations which would have very different consequences. So I welcome today's detailed discussion about ISDS, uh, and also in the context of TTIP, I think uh, I still have a lot to learn, and um, uh, I hope I'll be able to give a more decisive uh, sense of what to do uh, with ISDS and TTIP. At the same time, <clears throat> I think what, what also has to be taken into consideration is 
the question what would happen if we don't have it and who bears responsibility for that. So what would it mean for uh, the future and our trade relations with other countries than the United States, etc. So many questions still to be answered and I appreciate um, the knowledge sharing here this morning. Great. Uh, thanks very much. You want to pass the microphone to Paul. I should say that in, in the name of timekeeping here, I was at a, I was moderating a session at Chatham House the other day, and they uh, they were they have these amazing technical systems where you sort of uh, you press buttons as the moderator, and you can give red lights and green lights and amber lights. We don't have anything quite that sophisticated here today, but we do have an iPhone, uh, and uh, I am going to use my timer here to, to try and keep you guys honest. Amirja, I didn't warn you uh, of this, but you kept pretty much the two minutes. And so yeah, the, so it's it's a lovely little t tone that will come in. Maybe I'll put the microphone down to it. Uh, Paul, two minutes. The floor is Okay, I'm, I'm not going to go over the f more fundamental problems with the uh, ISDS. They have been mentioned in the, in the morning already. Uh, I want to react to co some of the um, so-called improvements that, uh, that the Commission is proposing. Uh, and I like the reference that uh, Jan made in the morning with uh, patches, putting patches on, a, on, a, on a, a model that doesn't work for what we want in the first place. And that's uh, also very much how we see it. We don't think that the patches will work. There's a, there's a whole la load of examples why the Commission proposals, uh, which are included in CETA, which are also in the, uh, in the consultation, why they don't work. For instance, conflicts of interest, the Commission is referring to uh, International Bar Association Code of Conduct. Well, that, bar that code of conduct doesn't even define what a conflict of interest is. So that's not going to work. The transparency. Of course, more transparency is good. But there is strong loopholes in the transparency uh, statements in, in CETA. For instance, using confidential business information as an exception for making information public. We all know from access to documents requests and discussions at the European level, getting information from the EU, that the confidential business information is in more than 50% of the cases used as the argument for not giving information. So, of course, also key information will not become transparent, even in the new model. So what, I can give a lot of more examples, but maybe they can come in the discussion. Um, what, do we think, uh, that, what do we think is the way forward? We think that uh, the Commission should not include ISDS in these two trade agreements. In the trade agreement with CETA, now the, the example is mentioned or the argument is mentioned. Well, but seven or nine countries have it already. So we need to keep it, we need to improve it. But the trade that these seven trade agreements cover with Canada is 5% of the trade between the EU and uh, Canada. So that means if you apply that logic that because of matching 5% of the trade, 95% of the trade would have to require, would, have, would be exposed to ISDS cases. We don't think that's the right way to go. Thank you. It's amazing the, the skill of these uh, uh, speakers to wrap things up on uh, on point there. I think look, there's, there's again some 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 important uh, questions that are raised. Uh, Louisa, I'm sure you've got a slightly different perspective on things. Yes, well, uh, I will try to to keep it to two minutes, which is good because my voice is not so good today. Um, I think in these discussions this morning, we are talking about different cases and under different frameworks. A lot of the cases that we've been talking about of ISDS are still based on intra-BITs, so bilateral investment agreements that exist between EU member states. We're also talking about cases that have to do with investment uh, at a multilateral level, and that's the Energy Charter, the Vattenfall case, for instance. And then we can talk about cases that exist under bilateral agreements that involve two different countries we talked, or two different regions. We talked already about NAFTA. We can talk about the cases uh, of the bilateral investment agreements that exist between EU, some EU countries and, and uh, US or Canada. So these are all different prospects. These are all different frameworks and they cannot be treated the, the same way. So the question is, if we don't have ISDS in TTIP, what will happen with these cases? It will continue to exist. The energy charter is still there. It will continue to be there. A lot of the bilateral treaties that exist between EU countries, they shouldn't already be solved, but they are still there. So what can TTIP do to improve the situation? If the system is so bad, and we as business admit that there is need to improvement, then I think TTIP is a good opportunity to do it, because if we don't have ISDS in TTIP, we will not be able to solve some of the 
problems that we have been hearing this morning. We talk about transparency. Yes, we are open to more transparency. You talked about business sensitive information. There is always some information that cannot be disclosed and we have it also in our national courts. So we agree we need to do more on improving the conditions for the claims. Yes, we talked about frivolous claims. We are open to discuss that. We are also to the open to discuss the possibility of an appeal mechanism. All of these we are open to discuss, but we believe that ISDS should be intuitive. Otherwise, there will be no improvements in the system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's fine. You uh, you're, 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 you're pretty close there. That's uh, not even. Uh, the um, well, look. Let, let, let's open things up to the floor. I mean, a couple of interesting points made by by the new panelists to add to the to, to, to the existing uh, comments. Jan, unfortunately, as, as as we said earlier, had to go back to uh, to London. Uh, the um, uh, I mean, one of the striking things to me uh, about this entire debate is some of the numbers that that James uh, threw out there uh, early on, which is. Uh, really, how, how, how common are these cases? And I think that, that, that's one of these questions. We often focus on individual cases. And you, uh, and Louisa, you raised an interesting point also about the intra-EU cases there. I think James this morning, and James passed me his, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, uh, speech, so, or his presentation, so I could read it uh, during the break there. But I mean, the interesting number there, that $26 trillion in FDI in the last two decades, 104, involving 104,000 multinational companies, and over that time, we've just had 568 cases. That doesn't seem like a huge number of cases uh, uh, to me. But at the, at the point, obviously, some, some totemic cases that we've seen. A very good uh, Friends of the Earth report uh, put out last week uh, on, on, on ISDS ahead of this, this conference, uh, which had a, a, an amazing number, I think, of 3 billion euros plus, was it, uh, in terms of awards uh, uh, that were claimed since 1990 by, 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 by companies. Uh, at the same time, the point being that there's only been 127 cases uh, in the EU uh, since 1990, which seems to me, I mean, as a, as a neutral observer, and I, I should claim uh, here that I am perhaps the only agnostic in the room uh, the, um, uh, on, on, on ISDS, but it seems like a, like, 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 like a fairly uh, low number. Um, why don't we, uh, at the same time, though, we have this, you know, th this very big issue that, that, that Celeste has raised of, uh, I mean, when you're citing Brown versus Board of Education uh, in, in, in a case there in terms of discrimination, that's, uh, you're certainly dra uh, drawing some attention to the issue there. This question of, of whether foreign investors deserve special treatment, I think that's a, a, a legitimate question uh, that we should be discussing. Uh, and Paul, as you say, really the discussion of fixing this, putting patches on a system that doesn't work. Uh, and that most people, I think, up here would recognize doesn't work and that needs uh, fixing is, is, is a really a, uh, interesting point. So why don't we open it up to the floor? Uh, why don't you put up your hand uh, nice, and, uh, nice and high and we'll, we'll, we'll collect questions in, uh, uh, in, in kind of groups of, of, of three. We have one in the front here. Anyone at the back of the room? You're not at the back of the room because you're shy. I know that. You've got, you've, got, you've, got, you've got some questions back there. But we can start with that. Is there a microphone that we can get around? If not, I can uh, I can wander the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. We heard a lot about the reforms that. And if I can just ask you to introduce yourself. Uh, yes. uh, uh, I'm Sanya from Third World Network, and we heard a lot about the reforms that could be made to ISDS, and I wanted to ask Celeste, in her experience of the US government, how likely is it that the US would accept any of these proposed changes to its model bilateral investment treaty, whether it's conflict of interest rules or um, maximum awards or no compound interest or something? For example, I think you had experience with trying to fix the US 2004 model bilateral investment treaty. You were either involved or closely watched the process. So did you succeed in getting any significant improvements? So how likely is it that the EU could get these improvements? And my second question to you is, could you give us any examples in the US of being chilled? So you don't have to be sued. You could be threatened with being sued, and that's enough to stop you regulating. We've seen Canada all over the place yeah. settles rather than regulates as soon as they're threatened with being sued. OK, so is the US willing to reform and tell us about regulatory chill? Any other questions from the floor here in the third row here? Thank you. I'm Hendrik Kukur with the Transatlantic Business Council. And this is more of a, a statement uh, than, a, than a question. Um, we represent 70 multinational companies. 
and not even a handful of them have actual ISDS cases. So just to add to this um, point on the proportionality between ISDS cases and uh, FDI stock. Um, and just one other point, um, picking up on Celeste's remarks about multinationals. Um, there is an interesting paper that the Center for Strategic and International Studies um, published a few weeks ago, which uh, has also uh, set, set up a number of um, sort of statistics one of them about um, US claims filed under ICSID. And that actually shows that uh, the over half of the, the claims are filed by SMEs and individuals. So that's just uh, to indicate that it's not only multinationals who are actually using it. And I think that indicates also that this is really a last resort. It's not something that multinationals or SMEs, any company for that matter, chooses um, as an, an easy way to sue governments is really a last resort and they will try every other channel before taking uh, a claim uh, to ISDS. Okay, so I'll turn that statement into question and say, ISDS, last resort? Uh, the, um, there was a question in the back there, uh, all the way in the back, one of the shy kids. Um, hi, my name's Sam from Friends of the Earth in the UK. Um, I just have a brief question. I wrote it down so that I wouldn't waffle. So um, we're told that we need a good ISDS in TTIP to ensure improvements globally going forward, essentially a gold standard. Um, can't the same argument be used in regards to rejecting it entirely? Would not the EU rejecting ISDS give greater legitimacy to those countries suffering and wishing to pull out? Could it not set the global standard to this regard? Okay, so we got the, the China question, really. Uh, the, um, uh, why don't we um, uh, uh, take these, the, these together? I'm going to go uh, sort of backwards in terms of order of speakers. James, I'm going to start with you. There's some questions there. Uh, really, th that question of, uh, uh, we'll come to you, Celeste, on that question of reforms in ISDS and, and would the U.S. accept on regulatory chill. The question, uh, the statement, which I've turned into a question on ISDS as a last resort, what do we know about that, James? And then this question of, of really the, the idea of setting a gold standard, James. I mean, uh, when you look out from, 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 from Geneva at the world of, uh, of investment treaties, uh, is TTIP an opportunity to set the gold standard? Thank you very much. Um, first, I just wish to have a brief comment on the sure. question raised here by the new panelists. Um, the, the question is that if we don't have ISDS, um, what do we have then? Um, that's the issue I raised in the morning in my, in my statement as well. Um, in fact, if you imagine at the stage in most of the investment treaties, we have both investor state and the state state. Imagine that we no longer have ISDS and we only have state-to-state. -state. What would be the implications for state-to-state? -state? Uh, what would be the implications for particularly small uh, economies and small countries when the, the, the dispute is escalated to, um, to, to the state level diplomatic uh, part? And um, what would happen if a big country is dealing with the, the invest, uh, dealing with an investment case while having a long list of aids, bilateral relationship on other issues when you put it there. So thinking a step ahead. So that's why in the morning I said that, that perhaps we should go beyond good and bad and focus on what if we do not have or what if we have and what should we have as a new ones. I think I fully agree with um, uh, Ms. Uh, Schacke's uh, point is saying that we need to look at different models also. Um, it applies to different groups of countries uh, for that. And then Sean mentioned this um, golden standard. Um, there was a claim of golden standards of the old generation um, at the time, what we call the era of globalization and liberalization. Now, now we are in the era of um, sustainable development as all efforts go into that. So the gold standard should be measured against contribution to sustainable development to the SDG goals, so to speak. And for that, so far, um, some programs are made. We documented in our World Investment Report in the, t in the table. But I think we're still far. The bridge is far. OK. okay. Thanks. Um, uh, Celeste, do you want to address this question of, is the US ready to reform? Um, I think the answer is no, and that that's based on a lot of experiences. Number one, the, the model bit review, which I wasn't personally involved in, but the AFL-CIO was as an interest group, um, and a lot of other groups in the room, the U.S. Chamber, some other groups. Um, we put forth, uh, along with environmental advocates, consumer groups, academics, 
a, an agenda of changes that needed to be made, very specific changes that could be made, for example, to uh, the definition of fair and equitable treatment. That didn't change at all. We put forth exhaustion of remedies. That was not accepted. We put forth all kinds of limitations <clears throat> going from ISDS to state to state, on and on and on. Every single one of them was rejected. And again, the candidness that the EU Commission talks about this and talks about the rights, USCR simply doesn't have that degree of candidness and continues to tell us foreign investors have no greater rights in the US, the system is fine, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say um, USCR is really unlikely. And even one of the, the proposed changes, um, Jan mentioned, Canada's definition of fair and equitable treatment, it has to refer to customary international law. That's in the US model, but that's in CAFTA. And in fact, in the RDC versus Guatemala case, the panel completely ignored it. So just putting, changing the language and telling panels, this is how you have to interpret this concept. If there's no way to hold the panels accountable, it's sort of pointless. Um, should I get to yeah, yeah, further questions? Do you want to address any other questions? So, um, <clears throat> examples of chill. I don't have a, I can't tell you a specific law in the United States that didn't move forward because of ISDS chill. I can tell you I have worked with state legislators who have told me they've contacted their alleged counsel in their state with ideas for bills and have been told that's a bad idea, that would violate our trade agreements, that might subject us to ISDS litigation. So state legislators have told me that. Um, in terms of ISDS as a last resort, um, and you know, d is it really small and medium enterprises? It's really expensive to pursue an ISDS case. I was on a panel um, just last week in Charlotte, North Carolina uh, with a CEO who had run six factories, three in the US, two in China, and I think the other was in Canada. And he was saying he couldn't bring a trade case because he couldn't afford the million dollars. So it's quite expensive and there's a Detroit International Bridge case where a monopolist who owns a bridge between the US and Canada is suing trying to prevent another bridge from being built, and it's not a last resort. He's doing this simultaneously while trying to pursue the case in US and Canadian courts. So that's just sort of, and then as far as the international gold standard, I agree with the proposal. I think the international gold standard is to get rid of the biased, flawed system where all these flaws are inherent, they're sort of built into the model, and start out with something else. It's not that, uh, Property should be expropriated without compensation. Nobody's arguing that, but they're arguing, is this really the best way to do that and be consistent with all the other needs of society? Richard, do you want to come in? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there's one thing that I, I do want to um, mention before uh, continuing to answer some of the specific questions. Um, and that is that a lot of the cases that are mentioned in ISDS are still pending. Uh, and so I think that that's important to keep in mind that some of the worst examples may never actually amount to anything. Uh, and I'm actually glad that the threshold, you know, is sort of there for cases to be brought, not to say that it would be more difficult for smaller uh, enterprises, but to deter companies from just pursuing that path over and over. I think that that is not the way we want to go. Uh, and, and when it comes to the chilling effect of US lawmakers, I was just, you know, thinking about the role that fundraising plays in American politics, and that that might be something to look at in terms of chilling effects a bit more than ISDS, but you know, perhaps topic for a different seminar. Yeah. I'm glad we don't have that problem uh, largely here in Europe, although uh, sadly now um, Front National is uh, taking loans from a Russian bank, which probably uh, is also not without constraints. I think that's also another seminar. It is, <laughs> but I just wanted to mention it to say, in terms of proportionality, indeed, of course, we have to take our responsibility as, as lawmakers and legislators, uh, but we are not uh, influenced only by um, one angle, ISDS. Now, the gold standard um, uh, suggestion, I'm a bit more careful about adopting that notion because I really think that the EU and the US are unique in the sense that we're the two largest open economies, open societies to a large extent and that it's really hard to compare that to, let's say, an investment treaty that the EU is negotiating with China. You know, we, we, we really have to see every trade agreement for 
the specific situation. Um, and so I, I don't really want to adopt the notion of gold standards, although to some extent if you have a large market and if you have, for example, a standard on electric cars, it is likely that that will become the global standard. But I think that that's a very different um, context there. And zooming in on the situation in the EU and the US, I think the taboo in the discussion about ISDS is a little bit that we, of course, have the rule of law. But we also have flaws in our rule of law. And we also have differences in different areas of the EU, different areas of the United States when it comes to, to courts. I mean, I don't know how comfortable um, you all would feel to have uh, a, court on some, a court case on something fundamental in, let's say, Hungary today. Uh, but I would much rather uh, be uh, before a Dutch court in that, in that context. And so I think it's, it's something that people don't really like discussing because it is some of the lower, uh, you know, lower... Um, standards of, of the rule of law in Europe that are just not so so um, great, but uh, I think the same goes for the US. It's really hard to say that there's actually one level um, throughout the country. Yeah. Uh, Paul? Maybe react to, to some of the points that you mentioned also, Marietje. Um, yes, in some countries in Europe the, the, the rule of law is not, uh, not f functioning so well. The, the key issue is if a, a US or another European investor goes to Hungary and does something, explores a mine for instance, which is harming a lot of citizens, then these citizens cannot go to an international tribunal. They have to rely on the court in Hungary. And so the fundamental question is why would the international investor be able to escape that situation while the citizens who are affected by that international investor don't have that right. And that's a fundamental problem which cannot be solved by any of the patches of the Commission. Um, I think on the, on the golden rules, I would say on the gold, very often the golden rules of today are the loopholes of tomorrow. The ISDS provisions are, uh, is my belief, will just not work. It's also what Celeste says. The three arbitrators can interpret the rules whichever way they want. And they've done that. There have been uh, attempts to already prescribe how arbitrators have to interpret the rules and they have ignored them yeah. and they will continue to ignore them. Um, on the, uh, some other issues, on the, um, you mentioned um, there's not that many cases. Um, that might be true if you look over the 40 year period. At the same time, what we do see in the last couple of years is a steep increase in number of cases. So that's also in the research that we uh, that we found in. Sure, I think I think James had a, a chart that I was trying to post here. We had 56 cases uh, last year that were filed in 2013, which is the second largest number of known cases in a single year. I think that's yeah. right, James. So investment is also awesome. exactly. But but that's, and that's, that's the point that you may not have heard him or Mauricio making the point that actually at the same time the stock of investment has has, has really increased. But if you see that. already that in the the 10 percent of the cases where there was publicly available information in 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 the EU yeah. led to three and a half billion. If that would be, then other 90 percent would be similar. That would be you would be talking about something in the range of 20, 30, 40 million, a billion euros of compensation. If that all is of those, actually, if, if all of those cases were successful. If all these, no, yes, no, no, no. If the same proportion of cases okay. would be successful as within okay. this 10%, that is actually a higher amount that citizens have to pay, taxpayers would have to pay, as what the European Commission was able to put in the investment fund a couple of weeks ago for uh, actually uh, solving the economic crisis in Europe. Okay, that's a new one. So TTIP that's another, is, that's TTIP another is an, issue as well. Uh, sorry, ISDS getting rid of it as an economic boost potentially. On, for, on, for uh, the last point I wanted to <coughs> mention was the chilling effect. Um, if you walk around, and I guess it's the same in Washington, but if you walk around in Brussels for a number of years and you follow legislative dossiers, there is hardly anyone, any dossier in which the argument of incompatibility with trade rules and possible court, uh, uh, court cases or ISDS cases is not brought into the discussions. We've documented one specific case, the Fuel Quality Directive, where actually Ms. Santon's own members have been threatening the European Commission directly with cases if the fuel quality directive, which is a standard to reduce emissions from car fuels, if that standard would be introduced as the Commission was planning to do it. Partly due to that pressure, also partly due to the Canadian government pressure, the whole regulation has been dismantled over the last month. So that's a very clear example of chilling effect. Okay. Even before TTIP exists. Right. Louisa, you're shaking your head. <laughs> 
not, I'm not aware that any of my companies or my members... We can show you the letters. They, they sent letters to the commission to with... Use, let, me, let me answer. Okay. Well, I, I'm not aware that any, any of my companies sent threatening letters uh, saying that they will use ISTS in, ca in the case of the Fuel Quality Directive. We are talking about internal legislation, we are not talking about an international treaty, so we're talking about two different things. But to come back to uh, some of the points and some of the questions that, that were raised. Yes, ISTS is a last resource. I mean, n more than 90% of the bilateral investment treaties have never been used to for a claim purpose. So they are there, but they are there to try to prevent these kind of situations to happen. And then on the question of the huge amount of money, yes, uh, it's very normal that at the beginning we are talking about huge amount of money, but you have to also, the claims, you have also to consider the level of investment because most of these claims come from sectors like energy that are highly intensive in terms of investments. So the proportionate of the amount that is requested is also connected to the level of investment, and we must not forget that. And my last point is, we are keep, keep assuming that every time an investor goes against the state is because the investor wants to lower the standards on environment or else. This is not always the case. It can be the other way around. It can be the case that an investment is on, I don't know, in renewables or in an environmental sector, and it's the opposite. It's the state that is coming back and taking some measures that are against environment, that are against labor and social issues. So we always assume that it's the other way around, and that's not necessarily the case. That's an interesting point, Mircea. I just wanted to briefly come back to the notion of threats and, and lobby attempts. I mean, if you m look at everything that comes at us as members of European Parliament through our inbox, from industry to NGO, from foreign countries to human rights defenders, uh, and the claims that are sometimes made or the expressions that are made, it can go quite far. And I think we should really look at you know, what members of parliament and, and uh, members of national parliaments and ministers do and hold them accountable for it. But just because some organization, from the left or the right, conservative or progressive, threatens or calls something, should really not be you know, given, given so much credit. Let us, let us make sure that lawmakers take responsibility for the decisions they make uh, and, and push them to do it you know, well balanced and everything else. But, but if I would have to um, take so seriously every threat that is made to me, I would have a, a very difficult life. I think it is my responsibility to actually balance uh, the information and the facts uh, on merit. What's, what's fascinating is we're having a lively debate up here in person, but then on Twitter there's also people having a lively debate there. Everyone's competing to be top of the Twitter wall uh, there. Nick Dearden, is he in the room here somewhere? Hold up your hand. There you are back there. All right. I think we should ask you to ask a question, maybe. Uh, the um, um, the um, um, so three um, uh, three more questions from the floor. Uh, we'll go second, third, and fourth row, just to here on the left, and then in the back because I've been talking about the shy kids back there for. A while. Thank you, Magda Stoczkiewicz, Friends of the of Europe. I'm sorry if uh, because I had to miss part of the debate uh, to go and talk about TTIP with Euro Chambers and the Commission. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe that was already mentioned. I wanted to pick up on uh, what Mr. Santos was talking about, that uh, the cases are not only to downgrade the, um, the standards, but can be the other way around and mentioning the renewables. We did a report uh, which showed that actually in Spain there were uh, law firms advising investors to go to Spain and invest in renewable energy at the time when it was already becoming clear that they will uh, stop financing, uh, supporting the, uh, the renewable energy, so that the companies could then sue the government in the arbitration and get the money uh, back through this way. And I, my question is, to what extent the ISDS, uh, there is a threat there that the ISDS is really a money-making machine for certain companies and law firms that know how to use it. Okay, so invest, uh, ISDS is as as an investment in itself. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Pascal Canet from the European Services Forum, representing the services industry. We uh, also have strong support of having ASDS in the international treaties, uh, simply because um, 
it's part of the trust that companies need to invest in the country. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the investment protection in which you do have. Um, and SDS has a tool to implement it. And my question relies to the domestic courts and the exhaustion of local remedies, which we do not have anything against. Um, and we also welcome all the improvement uh, which have been done in the CETA, in the Singapore Agreement, on the improvement of the system. Uh, we don't have anything against transparency and the hearings and all of these things. But there is uh, uh, still a question we have on what if a local court is not allowed to accept a complaint or part of a complaint because it is part of public international law and in the constitution of X and Y country, that court, local court, is not allowed to deal with public law, international public law. And, and that is, we have a big question, because if the judge will accept the complaint by another company, a local company, if that company, the foreign company, then goes to the same judge to ask for compensation, and the judge might say, I'm going to be able to tackle one part of that complaint, because it is part of my competence, but the other part, which is part of talking about yeah. discrimination, is not. The question is, how are we going to deal with this? Because okay. otherwise, we might run to a denial of justice. Okay, so a big jurisdiction uh, uh, question there. I wish, wish we still had the law professor on the, on, on the panel here. Shall I start? Yep. Uh, I'm Susan Treadwell from the Open Society Foundations, and my question is for Louisa. Uh, it seems that there is a fair amount of consensus in the room that the existing ISDS mechanisms that are in bilateral treaties and otherwise are flawed and have some weaknesses. And um, I have heard a number of arguments about positions why it's flawed from the, from the side of civil society that's representing different interests. But I'd be curious to know what the key weaknesses you have identified from your members, the business community, and how you would like to see those remedied in TTIP. That's a very good question. And then there was a gentleman in the back row there. Just all the way in the back. Oh. Um, Fabian Flus, Friends of the Earth Europe. Um, I've got part of a comment to the comment that was earlier made uh, from the woman from the Transatlantic Business Council who said that lots of medium and small enterprises use ISDS as a way, as a last remedy if, they're, uh, um, uh, if they feel treated unfairly by a, by a state. Um, the German Association of Medium-Sized Enterprises published a position paper in which they said that they are strictly against an ISDS mechanism in TTIP because it would allow multinational corporations to circumvent um, local courts and attack regulation. Um, so I want to know from Luisa Santos if there's any internal debate within Business Europe on this and if you truly represent all your members in this question. Okay, that's a good question. I, 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 I've got a question for the room here. How many people are here from Friends of the Earth? <laughs> um, uh, you guys have, uh, you, yeah, you, got, you stuck two questions in there. That's a, that's a, that's a clever, clever ruse. Uh, the, um, um, the, um, uh, I also have this question, which is up top of our Twitter wall here, which is this idea that, uh, that Paul mentioned, that citizens don't have recourse to special courts. Uh, I, I mean, there are, there are certainly cases in, in, in European courts that I know of, of uh, human rights cases where uh, foreign citizens have brought cases in Spain, for example. Uh, there's certainly cases in the U.S. Uh, of, uh, I think I'm right in saying, of uh, uh, foreign citizens bringing cases against U.S. companies. Sure, in, yeah, in U.S. Yeah. domestic courts, in US, in, not in, 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 in U.S. domestic courts, not a special form. That's a very good point. Uh, the, um, the, um, and there's another question coming from Friends of the Earth right there. Uh, the, um, um, the, uh, why don't we, uh, Louisa, start with you. Uh, work, work backwards. I mean, from this question, this last question there, of some voices in business aren't, um, aren't, aren't uniform on this. Well, there are a lot of business organizations in, the, in different countries. Um, in Business Europe, we represent the main organizations uh, across the EU member states. And this means that our organizations that have small and medium and medium and big companies. Considering how the EU economy is structured, it's clearly that we have uh, a majority of SMEs that are the basis of our, of our national members. 
Now, I'm not questioning <laughs> the, the statements done by the organization you mentioned. I have to tell you that the position in Business Europe is very clearly in favor of ISDS. Uh, but as already mentioned in the beginning of my intervention, and, and I will come back to, the, to, to try to reply to the first question on what needs to improve, there is also an agreement between Business Europe members that the system needs improvement. Now, what are the areas where we are looking for improvement? I mean, it's some of the areas that everyone has mentioned already today. We're talking about the arbitrators. How impartial are the arbitrators? Uh, we are open to discuss a code for arbitrators and the way they are designated. But I mean, some people mention they are not democratically elected. Yes, but the judges are also not democratically elected, by the way. So we need to, yes, there are improvements. We believe there are needs to be improvements, but there are limits to that. We also think there is room for more transparency in the claims. Again, uh, a lot of people, and even the Commission, uh, Mr. Schleichelmich said this morning, that he's not aware of a lot of cases. We are not aware of either, because the companies are not telling us exactly what are the, what are the legal arguments behind the case. Yes, there is room for more transparency, more public disclosure of information, to have public hearings, I think that's one also the, of the, the requests for, from a number of, of organizations. So these are areas where we are definitely looking at improvements. The other area is on the frivolous claims. A lot of people are talking about frivolous claims. Yes, if we can introduce mechanisms, filters that prevent frivolous claims, we're also open to, to consider that. And the other question is definition of concepts. I think a lot of people mention expropriation. We are talking about indirect expropriation, for instance. Um, we are talking about fair and equitable treatment. We need some sort of uh, definition. Of course, we cannot, in the definition, go to an extent that then uh, everything that goes, you know, two percent or three percent. Uh, back or forwards is not, is, not, uh, is not in line, but there is a level of definition that we should be able to agree on and that prevents precisely that certain cases that we consider as free wills going, going to court. J James, I just want to come to you very quickly. This question that we had, which really should be addressed to a law professor, but the question of local jurisdiction uh, and, 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 and when, uh, how are cases now handled where local courts don't have jurisdiction uh, investment case. I'm trying to think of a, a case where that might happen, and, I, and I'm struggling a bit. But I need to look into our database, but I don't think um, so far. In our database, we only <laughs> register those uh, investor state dispute cases. Um, I assume in the absence of uh, ISDS, then in, uh, I assume in the case that the local uh, courts um, has the problem of competency yeah. and then perhaps a state of state uh, dispute settlement kick in. Yeah. And that's another way of doing things in, in, since most of the treaties have state of state. And, and if I can just get you to keep the microphone there, this, yeah. this question, that, that our first question, which, which, which came there, of mm -hmm. how good of, of an investment is investing, uh, expecting uh, an ISDS right. return, given, given you've, you've, you've looked into the cases it's, and the it's, re it's really a big fee, I, I, I think, for, for lawyers. And we do see that uh, our, our database on bilateral investment treaties and on, this, on the dispute settlement cases we also got a lot of requests from law firms asking for the information regarding the, the treaties, the tax, and all these things. So, so, so lawyers do well, but do, um, do, do, do the investors, is it tend to be well, investors? Well, in terms of investors and, um, uh, and, uh, and the states, as I said uh, this morning, uh, half of the cases have settled. Uh, There's five, uh, uh, 568 cases, half of them. Yeah, so basically 270. 70 plus cases were settled, and the 43% of the cases were won by the state. And it's only 31% um, uh, of the cases won by the investors. Of course, this 26% of the cases were settled um, on the side, so we don't know that 26%. But the state win most of the cases. Having said that, we know in terms of the awards to the investors, it's a huge amount. Yeah. In, in many cases. As I said earlier, when you quote my figures on the perspective uh, about the 26 trillion US dollars and uh, over 
100,000 uh, TNCs with um, over close to 900,000 affiliates worldwide, and we have only 500 cases. We estimated the additional cases unknown could be 15 to 20 percent more, so okay. seven to 800. But I, I had this important note, seeing that some of cases do have important implications for for sustainable development policies, yeah. and that we have to bear that in mind, okay. and to deal with this type of uh, serious issues. Uh, Merge. Thank you, because I'm afraid I also have to run run away because we're going over time a bit, and I have yeah. an important meeting after this. But um, um, two things. One is I saw a question pop by on Twitter. Um, uh, why do we need it at all? I think it's a really important question. Why do we have it at all? Um, you know, there are investments going back and forth between the EU and the US. Um, you know, if, if there's so much wrong with it, why do we have it? The reason, of course, being historic, that it was actually the EU and the US or EU member states um, now and, and the US historically seeking these mechanisms when investing in states where the rule of law was really not a thing uh, even, even close by. And so I think that we're probably stuck with something that we created, you know, a monster we created in our own interest. Uh, and the question is, can it become you know, more legitimate, more future-proof, or not, and can we, uh, can we get away with it without uh, considerable damage? Yeah. But the reason is that we sought it. I think that that's something that we have, have to keep in mind, so we are now facing a problem of our own creation. And there's, there's, it's also an interesting point that we haven't really talked about here at all, which is that the world is changing. And I think, James, you guys at Unten have done some very uh, uh, interesting work on the flows of FDI. I think, am I right in saying this year will be the first year that China does more outbound foreign direct investment than does inbound foreign direct investment. Both the US and the EU are now in, in negotiations over bi bilateral investment treaties. There's a very real possibility that, that the, the fears of US multinationals coming here to the EU to, to use ISDS claims may in fact be talking about uh, Chinese firms uh, coming this way. But then the, the question is, do European investors need protections in China? It gets a lot more complicated, I think, when you, when you, when you bring China into the equation. Exactly. Celeste, you wanted, to, you wanted to get in there. Um, <clears throat> several points. Um, the first on China, I just I just want to say the U.S. is in its like 16th round of a bit agreement with China, and one of the things that I keep bringing up to USTR and it, it it doesn't address is, you know, as we're talking about China's outbound investment, how much of it is state-owned enterprises and how much is state-owned enterprises who who are controlled by the government? So you have a Chinese government deciding, oh, we're going to challenge this Czech law here and this German law here, and really doing what should happen through state-to-state -state negotiations through an ISDS panel. Um, and just in terms of this, this uh, you know, gold standard, 21st century, whatever this nonsense that folks are calling it is. So again, to get back to that question about, so there's seven bits with the U.S. and Canada, and so we have to now subject all of the rest of Europe to this because somehow that's going to fix the flaws in the existing treaties. I haven't really seen any guarantee that the existing bits are going to go away or be fixed. And what we know about the system, um, I'd love it if I saw a case where a company sued a government to say, I want to be regulated more. Please raise your labor standards. Please raise your environment. I, I haven't seen it. I, I'd love yes, to see I mean, it. There's, there's one case that I find really interesting just because of my profession, uh, and, and that is the Al Jazeera uh, Egypt case, which is now starting to bubble up, where Al Jazeera has looked at the imprisonment of its journalists in Egypt uh, following the fall of Mubarak and, and in recent years, and is, and is actually now looking at mounting an ISDS case against Egypt because that is the only w avenue that they see. Um, having tried the, 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 the local court system. So. Yeah, and, and that goes back to the question, Al Jazeera can because it, it is an investor, whereas the residents, the indigenous residents around Chevron's polluted area in the Amazon and Ecuador didn't have that same responsibility. I mean, in general, it's a system that's rigged toward a particular model, which is neoliberalism. And that's really the question that we have to ask ourselves. Do we want to lock in neoliberalism forever. You know, it might be a trend right now, it's popular right now, but is it going to be popular forever? And I, I just want to add, those who say that the uptick in cases is because there's more international investment, all of that investment is not covered by ISDS treaties. The $4.2 trillion in transatlantic investment between the U.S. and EU is 95% not covered. Um, no investment into Brazil is covered 
most investment into China is not covered. So really, as an economist, you look at the rate of change, and the rate of change says this system, scheme, whatever you call it, is going to continue increasing because that's its rate of change. And when you talk about you know, the lawyers, there's also a third-party funding system now where investors go around and say, which of these lawsuits looks the most lucrative and which am I going to fund? So there's, there's a lot more going on here. And in, essentially, you're providing a subsidy um, to invest in, in a risky place where the investment might not happen, whereas the pro-development answer would be, let's invest in the judicial system so that everybody who lives there can have equal access to a good judicial system, rather than subsidizing a private judicial system where every single gain achieved will go back to that private interest and there's no mechanism to share it. Celeste, you're gonna have the last word there. I'm very sorry, we've, we've, we've run 15 minutes over on this in the name of bringing us back to schedule, in the name also of feeding you, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna to have to close things there. Uh, there are other questions on the floor. I know there's a whole, so a whole afternoon of panels uh, and I'm sure you guys can, 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 can come back there. Can you do me a favor? Can you put your hands together for uh, the people up here? Louisa, I know you've been battling the corner. Thank you very much for your time.